My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. There is a force that holds men backward, that hovers around this place, and to make things worse, you are living in the time of crisis. We have that envelope of enthusiasm and joy of the spirit is punctured by fear. So many live in uncertainty, not knowing what will happen. And when we encounter such operations in the landscape, the most potent dimension of piercing through the, the radar of darkness is the instrumentality of prayer. So that a new possibility can be trapped within the regions of the territory. When myself and my brother Victor were coming last yesterday, they dropped us about two kilometers to this environment. And the people from the other side are not even as much as cross. Neither do the people from this region cross to the other side. So, a non-tribal person had to drive us through the border. And the place was dry. Destruction everywhere. Hoping in the atmosphere. If you are not even sold out for the kingdom, you will see such things will come back. And say, God will help his people. In fact, we saw a vehicle that was burnt the night before we came. So vehicles come, they drop people and they turn back. And then the driver said to the next driver that will go through the border. But destruction is not your portion. He said, a thousand shall fall by your side. Ten thousand by your right hand. It shall not come near you. With your eyes, you shall see and behold the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the most high, even the God of heaven, your habitation. So tell somebody it's not your portion. This is the morning of your life. Hallelujah. Last night we decided to establish the coordinate that will define the foundation upon which the teaching is the cause of this conference we build. And we said. The gospel is the vehicle of communicating the will of God to a generation. The possibilities that are captured in the mind of the Father, that motivated creation, can never find expression in a generation except as it is communicated by the gospel of Jesus. And we said Christianity is the proof that the gospel has been received. Because when you look at a Christian or the move of the faith, it is expected to be a complete characterization of the possibilities that the Father envisaged before he began the protocol of creation. So when we speak about the power of God, Christians and Christianity is supposed to be that envelope and infrastructure through which the power of God can be seen. When we talk about the righteousness of God, that which gives God the capacity to always be right, never to be wrong, that which makes God an entity of rightness, we said the only means by which it can be seen in the visible world is through a company of a people called Christians. So Christianity is actually life beyond the boundaries of mortality. Christianity is actually the ability to capture and host the 
dimensions of God and to give expression to the same. And we said it is not possible to mirror the dimensions of God except to have come to a point where you apprehend it. When you gain knowledge and understanding of those dimensions of God. And by the help of the Spirit yesterday, we established that knowledge in the Spirit is not a function of the largeness of the mind. Knowledge is not a function of your ability to gather information. We said knowledge is consciousness of reality. And the proof of knowledge is transformation. So a man has no knowledge of spiritual reality unless it has become his predominant consciousness. And the moment any dimension of God becomes your predominant consciousness, the first indication of that possibility, most head in that person, is the transformation that you see on the land. So I told us yesterday how that it is not enough to preach righteousness. You may have the exegetical understanding of the doctrine of righteousness, but the proof that you have understood righteousness is that righteousness becomes your present consciousness. And the only way we can check it is that your life becomes an importance of the righteousness of God. We said it's not enough to give articulate expression to the doctrine of prayer. The proof that a man understands prayer is that something is weaved into his infrastructure and he becomes a prayer man. Not just having the ability to pray, but receiving answers to his prayer. That is a man that understands prayer. And that is why we look at our lives and our life is a complete contradiction of the things that we profess. Because there is something we need to understand beyond the lexicons that are communicated to us through the experience of others. The experience of a man, as inspiring as it is, cannot bring you to the realization of your full potential unless yourself apprehends that knowledge in the spirit. And I told you, one of the greatest crises of Christians is the lack of understanding. Jesus lived with his disciples for about three and a half years. It was not recorded anywhere in scripture that he healed any of them. It was not recorded anywhere in scripture that he provided for their personal needs. Because Jesus knew whatever he gave them would deplete. Jesus wanted them to enter into a womb in the spirit. Where they would sustain their capacity to generate the same things that he generated. And the only way Jesus achieved that goal was to plead on them and to open their understanding. So that they will understand the scripture. So they will no longer need to ask. They will no longer need to depend. They have become the source that generates those dimensions in the natural. Because through understanding, they have the ability to receive from God. So a man who lacks understanding can call himself a Christian. But manifestly, he will not host and express the dimension that is captured in the articulate archive of Christian experience. So when experience is lacking in your work with God, your first crisis is the crisis of understanding. Many don't understand. We speak both. We think our bold expression will bring us into experience. There are things that we need to understand. Many have no understanding. The devil is aware that everything you need for life and godliness is already at your disposal. But he knows that the moment he robs you of understanding, even though you have all you ever need, you will never walk in the experience of it. So when you come for a program, the devil may not stop you from coming from the, for the program, but the devil will steal knowledge from you. So Jesus gave a parable of the soul. He said the seed was cast. He said, but to some it was stolen. The head of the people came and stole it. So it's not easy. You can stay in the presence of God. The devil is not moved. He's not moved that you came to church. He's not even moved that you talk only about your congregation, about your pastor. The devil is interested in what you know because he knows the moment you know his authority over you is stripped. So understanding is the first point of battle in the spirit realm. And that's why the Bible said, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. Many are walking in ignorance. In terms of spirit reality, ignorance is called darkness. 
The Bible said concerning Jesus, He said, He's the light, life that lighted every man that cometh into the world. So, one of the things that Jesus comes to do for a man is to bring him into the realm of understanding. Any area that you are ignorant is an area of slavery, and you will continue to be in slavery perpetually unless God does something to open your mind. Many lack understanding. There are many people talking, but few have authority because authority is a proof of understanding. The Bible said in Job chapter 38, verse 7, He said, Declare now understanding. The moment you have understanding, you have the authority to declare. That's a principle in the spirit realm. The moment God came to Job, He said, With this, that darkness counsel by walls without knowledge. The reason Job was in captivity at that time is because his understanding was fruitful. So the moment God came to speak with Job, he did not even talk about what Satan did. Because what Satan did would have been of no effect except that his understanding in the operational dimensions of God consistent with his observation at that time was not with him. Remember Job said, from the days of my youth, in Job 29 verse 4, he said, I how did he put it now? He said, The secret of God was upon my tapala. And the Bible said there was no man as great as Job in all of the East. So what gave Job greatness in the East was because the secret of God was upon his tapala. But here comes a new dimension of Asana mastered against Job. And Job suddenly had no understanding. And the moment Job had no understanding, Job became afflicted. So I told you yesterday, instead of fighting to defend the church and denomination you attend, fight for understanding. Because when the calamities of life comes to you, they will not respect the church you attend. They will respect what you know and what you have become. Many Christians walk without understanding. It's the crisis of life. And if we are looking at rejecting the true Christianity, then we must come back again to know what exactly we believe. Because a lot of people don't know what we believe. They were told when they were children that Jesus is Lord. They don't even know the meaning of Lordship. They were told when they were young that Jesus died for them on the cross. And we even carried crucifix on our necks. But we don't know what the cross is. They were told that Jesus rose from the dead. But they don't even know what it means to rise from the dead. They don't understand significance of spiritual realities and operations. And that's why, even though this, all of these things have definite implications on their life, they don't walk in its experience. If you know what it means that Jesus died, the power of sin will be broken from your life. The cure to the power of sin is the cross. The dimension of God that furnishes the ability to walk the newness of life is the resurrection. What gives you the authority for your calling is the ascension. And what gives you right standing with God is the blood that was sprinkled in the eternal tabernacles of heaven. But all of these things are not an experience because we lack understanding. The moment understanding is not punished, we become religious people. And we are not different from the Muslims. We are only happy because we feel Christianity is the best, but we don't even know what it is. So we must begin our journey from the starting point of accurate understanding. To know what Christianity is about and what this dimension of God, this act of God that is moving to every generation, what it is built upon. The moment that understanding comes, the things you struggle with will become stories. I asked you a question yesterday. I said the things you struggle, the things you understand, you still struggle with them. And everyone said no. So the reason we struggle is because we lack understanding. Take me deeper, deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deeper, deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. Our love. Yo 
in the name of Jesus. If we can't teach what I want to teach, then we will communicate it as a body of spirit through impartation. But it must enter your spirit. It must enter your spirit. If I can't teach it, then I will communicate it as a body of spirit. Hallelujah. God bless you. May be seated. You know, the devil is smart. He has gained mastery on how to frustrate the things of God. And that's why sometimes students of God must be prepared. That worship you led, that worship you led, if you know the volume of life that was communicated in that worship, but you see, a lot of people could not receive it because spirits travel on vibration. The sound wave that you were generating did not reach them. So the energy you were emitting, they do receive it. Now, that's a, that's a minus on their part. Because that worship is supposed to be part of the blessing for this meeting. It's, a, it's an intelligence in the demonic realm. But sometimes Christians take things for granted because they don't understand the rules of engagement. 10 million people can come for a meeting, they will not be blessed because of batteries in the, in the, in the microphone. Somebody will be careless about battery. And 10 million souls will be at stake. If we are taught and we gain maturity, we will see kingdom as warfare. You don't know the demons that were mobilized to fight this meeting. Because of the one soul that God will reach out to, knowing the impact of the life of that person, it returns to the Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. It's fine. Not to worry. Glory to God. Are you with me so far? Somebody laugh at the devil. Do you know why the devil is so scared? You may be seeing yourself as one weak girl. After all, I don't have anything in my family. You think you are the mercy of people. The devil knows you. The day you gain understanding, you become a terror in the kingdom of darkness. People like Captain Kuman were shy, frail, weak, and vulnerable. Even the Bible school she went to, they didn't know her. Because they judge potentials based on looks. Demons judge potentials based on your star in the spirit. Some of you look feeble. They they understand the gods. <laughs> Did you read about the a madman of Gadara. He was in the tomb, cutting himself. The guy was an evangelist that could take pennies. Death. But you look at him and you say his life is finished. The devil knows people. That's why Jesus can cross over after a crusade. Do you know what Jesus did before he went to the madman of Gadara? The Bible said in Matthew chapter 8 verse 1. That he descended from the mountain. 
He saw a leprous person. He healed him. A multitude came to Jesus. He healed them. He left there, went to Peter's mother-in-law. He healed her of fever. When evening was come, they brought a crusade to him. People who were sick. He healed all of them. He was supposed to be tired. The Bible said, he said, Enter the boat. Let's cross over to the other side. Why would Jesus not sleep for one night? Because Jesus saw the potential of ten nations locked in one man. You see a one man, but Jesus saw ten cities. That's how devils see. So some of you, they will keep you in bondage to immorality. You think it's about you. They are seeing ten nations. Because you are pregnant with ten nations. The reason Jesus sent men to you is because he's not just seeing you, he's seeing your possibilities. That's why Jesus will cross over. Did you know that when Jesus was crossing to the other side, the Neviata in the red in the sea began to fight the boat so that they will turn to the other side. But Jesus got up and rebuked the storm. Why? Ten cities need to be delivered in one man. So when we see the devil doing things like this, we are encouraged because we know there is somebody in the congregation. I was thinking you say I'm the one. Many don't know how to receive. Ah! If you know the power I came into this world with, the power. The devil wants to frustrate me. Me. I am an apostle. Do you know what the apostolic ministry signifies? The apostolic ministry is a governmental ministry. It comes to establish the mandate of Zion. We are not teachers of the world. We are not preachers of the gospel. We are executioners of the eternal counsel of God. <laughs> because I am here, there are many people that must come out of darkness. See, I don't need to pray for you. My coming here is a witness. And the devil is too small to frustrate what God wants to do. You reign, you ancient Zion's king. Kados, Kados, you are mighty on your throne. Zion's king, Kados, Kados, you are my king. Hey, Amalaka Barabas, you reign, you reign, Zion's king, Kados, Kados, you are my. of making a decision whether to continue with the teaching or to begin to release the power of God (laughs) 
Arakata da da da. Ura pa 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 satalama. Hey! You roll, you roll. Nado. Listen, listen. Do you know what will happen tonight? I just received the breaking news now. God is going to ordain 12 apostles here this night. It's because of what I've heard now that I will continue this teaching. Because these ones, these ones, they need to hear what I want to say. God will ordain 12 apostles here tonight. Your campus is about to be set on fire. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. <laughs> hey. Ay, 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 ay. The fire is bubbling in my spirit. But I need to tell you something. Because most of you here, the hand of God will come on you in a strange way tonight. In a strange way. It will carry you from a position of obscurity to a place of witness in the kingdom. Shame on Satan. You know, I hate the devil. I have a personal hatred for the devil.
thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. You may be seated. You may be seated. Understanding is the key of spiritual authority. Understanding is the key of spiritual authority. Every area of your life where you gain understanding, then you have just entered into authority. Jesus said, be of good cheer. He said, I have overcome the world. And the Bible said, according as his divine power, he has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. But he said, it is through the epignosis, the revelation of Jesus. So every area of your life where you secure understanding, in that area you have overcome the world. If it's an area of sin, if it's an area of prosperity, any area, no matter what, the moment understanding is granted you, you have overcome the world. Because at that point, you become one with him. Because the Bible said, the goal of this kind of knowledge he said so that you and I can become partakers of his divine nature. So when we come into understanding, we share in his divine essence and authority. And so I said, understanding is so important. But there are things you need to understand. There are definite realities you need to understand. It's not just an understanding of a focus undefined reality your understanding must be emphatic and it must be effectual there are definites in this kingdom and one of those definites i want to talk about tonight is one thing that is at the heart of christianity is called the cross many don't understand what the cross is what is the cross you can summarize Paul's gospel as the teaching of the mysteries of the cross. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 1, he says, And brethren, when I came unto you, came not I with excellency of speech, declaring unto you the counsel of God. He said, But I choose not to know anything among you. He said, But Christ and him crucified. He said, For when I came unto you, I was declaring the counsel of God unto you in twofold. He said it is Christ and Him crucified. So one thing that Paul established his doctrine upon was the revelation of the cross. When the Galatian church stepped back, you know the Galatian church is one of the churches that Paul gave birth to. He said in Galatians 4.19, he said, my little children, of whom I travel again in prayer, until Christ be formed in you. He better the Galatian church. So the Galatian church is one church where Paul poured out his heart. And what did Paul say about the Galatian church? He said, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? He said, have you begun in the spirit and you are made perfect in the flesh? And he made a statement. He said, was it not before you that Christ was presented crucified? So the Christ that Paul preached to the Galatian church was the crucified Christ. Paul painted the picture of the gospel so much so that if you heard Paul, it will look as if you are seeing Jesus on the cross. The cross is at the center of our belief system. What is the cross? The cross is not a piece of wood with a man nailed. It's beautiful when you carry the crucifix. If it is there to create a consciousness of Jesus and his finished works. But Jesus and the cross is not just a man on a crucifix. The cross is everything that Jesus did that qualifies you for all of the blessings of God and empowers you to be an executioner of his kingdom. It is the cross 
that makes you a candidate of the blessings of God. It's the cross that brings about your restoration into glory. And it is the cross that gives you legitimacy to interact with God. The moment Jesus resurrected, the status of the disciples changed. They were not there. He told Mary Magdalene, he said, go and tell my brethren. For the first time, these were servants. They promoted to become friends. But the moment the demands of divine justice was attained, their status changed. They were not even there. Peter and the disciples were not there. In fact, Peter had denied Jesus before he died. But Jesus sent because the demands have been paid. He said, go and tell them that they are now brothers. Because of the, the demands of the cross and the price that was paid, we are no longer servants. We are no longer friends. We are brothers with Jesus. So we become legitimate heirs of the kingdom. So when God blesses you now, God is not doing you a favor. God is giving you your inheritance because of the cross. A lot don't understand. So when God blesses them, they think it's the favor of God. It's deeper. The blessings of God given to a believer is a portion of his inheritance because of the works of Jesus. That's why we cannot stop praising Jesus. A man who cannot praise God does not have the revelation of the cross. The moment Jesus resurrected, he said, we are now brothers. And Paul said, we are heirs with Christ. We are heirs. How dare you? Do you know who he is? He said he's the only begotten of the Father. But certainly, the moment the demands of divine justice was paid, Jesus was no longer the only begotten of the Father. You and I became begotten of the Father. So Jesus said we are brothers. It's the cross. Before the cross, you were friends. You were servants. But after the cross, you are brothers. So Jesus becomes a brother. So when I come for healing, I don't need down to beg God for healing. I command him because of the cross. Did you see when we minister to the sick? We don't come and say, Lord, please have mercy and heal this person. We say, be healed in the name of Jesus. Why? Because healing is the children's bread. And you became a son because of the cross. It's a revelation that every believer must have in order to have authority in this life. The devil will not fight you because you are a Christian. The devil will fight you because you are ignorant and he will win. But the day knowledge comes, there are some that say, don't touch. If you go near, you are in trouble. <laughs> These ones have authority because they have gained understanding. You are still there begging God, please give me my daily bread. You don't know how to pray. Now we don't beg bread anymore. We command bread. Oh, yeah. You need to see a man of understanding pray. He rises up in the morning and he said, Thank you, Father, because I am mightily helped of God. He said, Thank you, Lord, because the gold is mine. The silver is mine. Why? Because I am an, a co-heir with Jesus. Why is that so? Because of the cross. He said in Romans 8.32, He said, He that spared not his only son, but gave him freely for us. How shall he not with him give us all things? Because of the cross, you have all things. So I don't go asking and begging for things. I command them because I have them. If you have money in your bank account, do you beg to withdraw it? It's the cross. I 
Have you seen the devil before? <laughs> if you see a demon and you don't have revelation, you will run. I've seen spirits and they are ugly. You know, Kenny Hagin said that demons are like monkeys. So everybody now say demons are monkeys. You have not seen enough. I've seen beasts in the spirit. There was a time in prayer, my door, my wall opened, and I saw a lion that is as big as this building, and it had two heads, and it was running towards me, trying to eat me up. I stood up. I said, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and the lion did not realize. If you don't have understanding, hey, uh, oh my God, I see spirits. I saw a demon that was only head, only head with spikes everywhere, and it was rolling about, injuring people. And when I saw it, I said, How dare you? This is my space. Are you not aware that as it is, so are we in this world? And the demon dematerialized. The revelation is from the cross. You know why? You have authority over the devil, not because you fasted and prayed. You have authority over the devil because he said he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in victory he's not winning over them in battle he triumphed in victory so you begin from victory so when we challenge the devil we are not fighting to win we have won is the cross the reason many christians are beckoning it's because they have not revelation of the cross they are not sure of the love of god if you know what jesus went through for you to become the heir of god then you don't need anybody to tell you god loves you you will run on the street you say i'm loved of god i'm loved of god do you know what it means for the son of god to become man you have not thought about it because you don't meditate on scripture imagine if there was a crisis you own an aquarium with fish and there was crisis and the only way the, the, the crisis can be resolved is for you to become a fish how important is fish did you remember that when the children of israel erred against god the bible said in exodus 32 verse 30 he said to moses he said i will erase them from the face of the earth and start a new generation with you that means the whole of humankind compared with sovereignty is nothing god can wipe away the whole of humanity it will still be right so why would god die for humankind that he can wipe away in a second is called the love of god that's why he didn't say for god is so powerful he said for god so love the world it's like a man that owns an aquarium at most the fish is ten thousand at most is hundred thousand at most is three hundred thousand you can throw the whole thing away for a millionaire and say bring a new aquarium today and load it with fish why will you become a fish to save fish it's God the love of god jesus did not just become a human being so that he will go back and become a god Till tomorrow he's a man so you become a fish you save the fishes in the aquarium and even when you return to live with us you are a fish imagine now that you are living with us as a fish you have the same mentality you have the same mind with us because you are now man but your nature will remain a fish it's called the love of god today jesus returned to the divinity the trinity and he's a man it's like a fish living around man. it's the love of god so the cross is the revelation of the zenith of the love of god so when i relate with god i don't relate in fear i relate with confidence because if he spared not his only son and gave it freely for me anything i'm looking for he is more than willing to give it because jesus is bigger than everything god has the moment he gave me jesus he gave me everything is the revelation of the cross the reason most of you cannot relate with god is because you don't know the cross let me tell you something we don't encourage sin one of my my area of specialization is the doctrine of alignment but in the cross even your sins don't hinder you from fellowship 
That's why when we see we don't run away from God, we run to God. Because the provision for forgiveness is in the cross. That's why after the demands of the cross were met, God declared that you are his righteousness. He didn't say you are righteous. He said you have become his righteousness. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, he said he gave him for us. He made him that was without sin to become. Listen, he didn't just say Jesus took sin. He said Jesus became sin. So you did not just take righteousness. You are now the essence of righteousness. So if somebody wants to understand what it means for a man to stand right with God, you are the one you will look at. You have become the righteousness of God. That's why when you see you go to him for forgiveness. Because you know that an economy of ever acceptance been downloaded in your vessels. It's called the mystery of the cross. If you don't have understanding of the cross in this world, you have no authority because the devil will come with a lot of stuff. That's why you are going for a power service, and the devil told you, You that didn't pray, who told you the power of God will move? I don't move in power because I pray, I move in power because when he downloaded the Holy Ghost, he downloaded it with power. The reason I pray and fast is not because to create power. There's nothing you can do to create power. The reason we pray and fast is so that our soul can respond to power. Because the power is there, but your soul is falling. When you pray and stay in the presence, your soul is hiding to a level where you can host the dimensions of power. That's why we pray and fast. If you think what you do, we create justification and acceptance. You are drifted into legalism. And God hates it. Remember, they taught in Corinthians. They were fornicating. They were lying. They were having incest. They were carnal. But Paul still called them saints. But when he came to the church in Galatians, he called them foolish and bewitched. What's the difference? The Galatian church were not sinning. But they drifted into legalism. The Corinthian church sinned. They realized they have sinned. And they are asking for forgiveness for the Galatian church. They want to do something that makes them feel because of what they have done, they qualify. And Paul said they are bewitched. Nothing God hates like you trying to equate your sacrifice with the sacrifice of Jesus. You don't know what God went through when he gave Jesus. The mystery of the Trinity is the mystery of oneness. But for the first time, the mystery of Trinity was defined when Jesus became sin because he had to be separated. You don't know what God went through on the cross. So when you sacrifice to host immortal things, you are not sacrificing because you are paying the price. You are sacrificing because you are paying the price not to create but to be able to host what has been given to you because you are a holy man. Legalism is trying to create your own righteousness from your works. Legalism is trying to add something to the sacrifice of Jesus. The work of Jesus, Jesus said, it is finished. Nothing more, nothing less. Why do we sacrifice? So that we can boast what we already have. Because our soul has become rebellious. So when we fast and pray, we are bringing our soul to our life. Our soul don't want to travel in the direction of the spirit. We are bringing it to our mind. That's why we labor in the spirit. The mystery of the cross is the central of our belief system. It's because of the cross that the devil cannot challenge you. It's because of the cross that God cannot reject you. Because in the cross, it made you an eternal oneness within you. Before Jesus went to the cross, it was a prayer. That they may be one as we are one. But after he went to the cross, it was a decree. Go and tell my brethren. Oneness has been achieved. It's called the mystery of the cross. Nothing imparts trust and assurance like an understanding of the finished works of Jesus. I don't have time to open it layer by layer. I would have shown you the 12 pillars of redemption. And then you will see the implication. The reason I'm an, I'm, an, I'm an apostle today preaching is not because I'm special. He said, All to him that ascended. He said, He's the one that descended. He said, But after he ascended, he gave gifts unto men. These things are called gifts so that you will never think you end it. So I'm an apostle because he ascended. 
and he left me with a responsibility. Somebody else is a prophet because he ascended. He is a gift of the divine. And that's why we have authority. Because at the ascension, he has already defeated Satan. So when I show up, even when I've not prayed, if I invoke the power of my ordination, Satan bows. Because I'm speaking from an ascended position. My nephew was dying. And my sister was rushing him to the hospital. And then she realized I was in town. And she rushed the little boy to me. And the boy was really stretching and dying. Victor, you were there. I grabbed him and I said, I invoke the powers of my ordination and I put life back into you. And the boy instantly was restored and began to ask for food. He had not eaten for two days. When our faith fails, our ordination speak because it's from an ascended position. The mystery of the cross. Many don't know it. Never do something to receive justification. You are justified in Christ. Every labor we labor is so that our soul will be able to receive what Jesus paid for. And so that we can be rewarded in eternity. Justification is by faith. Righteousness is by faith. I know a lot of people that want to preach that you do this, do that. We don't fight it. But it will be an overflow of the imputed reality. That's when it will count the time. The reason a lot of people are so proud is because they think they don't it. So here somebody comes to pray and it begins by telling you that he has fasted for 10 years. If he fasts for 10 years, glory to Jesus. And that's why his soul is responding to God at that level. But it doesn't mean his idiot is a doctor. John was in the witness until the day of his showing forth. It doesn't mean for you to come to God when they give birth to you, they should go and drop you in the wilderness. There are some people who came out of the palace like Moses and they began to preach. There are preachers today who have never suffered. So the knowledge of God is not witness based, it's revelation based. Never use your experience as a doctor. Our strength is in our understanding of the cross. How much of it you know? Is what determines the authority you command. You find yourself still a slave in the hand of demons. You have not known the cross. You find yourself still a sinner. You have not known the cross because it's on the cross that sin was destroyed. What I'm saying now, you may not know the implication, but I'm already dealing with the spirit of guilt and depression. The devil uses it to put a lot of people in slavery. God hates sin. But the cure to sin is also in the forgiveness of God. And if you don't understand the weight of the cross, the devil will use what is supposed to be your help to become your body. It's in the cross that your sins are forgiven and forgotten. Do you know why you were able to be born again? Do you know why you are able to repent today? Jesus didn't die today. He died 2,000 years ago. Why are you able to receive repentance? Because what happens on the cross went into the past, it taught the present and it covered the future. Listen, <laughs> you can't receive this, so I will not tell you. But even your children, they will see. You know why they will be forgiven? The cross. Because the cross 2,000 years ago paid for the sins of 10,000 years later. So even your children, we have hope because there is the cross. If they recognize it, it deals with iniquity. Now let me bring the balance and then we'll begin to pray. The cross has provision and the cross also has demands. The provisions of the cross are the things you understand that gives you confidence and faith. Remember, the Bible says, who has believed our report? It says, unto whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. Understanding this, that faith in you, it says faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. So if you don't know these things, you will never have faith in God. 
But after you have known it and you have believed in God, then the cross brings a government. Because everything Jesus paid for is a, an economy in your spirit. But God is not only interested in your spirit, He's interested in your soul and in your body. That's why in your spirit He says you are healed, past tense. But in your body you can still be sick. So what do you do to bring the experience of your spirit into your body? It's called the demands of the cross. The cross has a demand. Many don't know it. Because if I don't explain the demands of the cross to you, many people will live there today and begin to sing aloud that they are righteous, that they are this, but they will not pay attention to the demand of the cross. The first demand of the cross is understanding. That's what I've been explaining. He said in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, he said that we are very with him. He said we should reckon also, having reason with him, that we walk in the newness of life. So what he's trying to tell you is that even though you are dead with him and he's resurrected, if you do not calculate it that you are resurrected, you cannot walk in the newness of life. So first, walking in the newness of life is a function of revelation. And that's what I've been trying to establish. But the second demand of the cross is the demand of submission to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost came upon the resurrection of Jesus. But why did the Holy Ghost come? The Holy Ghost came to bring us into the experience of what is available by the cross. Jesus said in John 16, 13, He said, I have many things to tell you. He said, but you can't receive it now. How be it when the Spirit of truth is come, He will guide into all. The realities are already available. But you need someone called the Holy Spirit to take you into them. So the cross provides for righteousness, provides for healing, provides for forgiveness. But the only way you can walk righteousness, walk healing, walk forgiveness, is if you give to the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost is the one that carries, carries, carries you into all reality. Unfortunately, many are not submitted to the Holy Spirit. Do you know why you come from meetings like this? And then you think you are blessed, but you go home, you lose everything. Because the work of the Holy Ghost does not end the meeting. It continues after the meeting. You yield to the Holy Ghost in the meeting, but after the meeting you disallow. So what the Holy Ghost wants to establish in your life, you now disallow. And the devil is smart. The devil may not stop. But he knows what to do after the meeting so that you don't walk in the blessings. That's why you come for three days meeting. You are hungry and you are crying. But the moment you go home, you carry your phone to go on Facebook. Then the Holy Ghost shows up and says, no, don't log in now. You don't understand that the protocol for the meeting is the time of its execution. The devil will be showing you things you can do on Facebook. So a warfare of the mind begins. Whether you will submit to the Holy Ghost or submit to the demands of the devil. The devil say, log in. Come on, your friends have been waiting for you. Do you know how many likes you have? How about those pictures you uploaded last week? You have not even checked them. What the other are you doing? Are, are you the one that killed Jesus? The devil. But the Holy Ghost comes. You don't understand that where we fall are the simple everyday things. Because the everyday things we do, they are weak into our lives. So when the devil wants to fight you, he doesn't fight you from your knowledge of the Bible. He fights you from your everyday reaction and activities. The Holy Ghost says, don't knock it. Don't knock it. There's a fire that has been deposited on your heart. But you go home and in two days, you digest what you receive in three days from the mountain. So your meeting and every experience you have becomes a waste because you don't understand the demands of the cross. The demand of the cross is that you obey and yield to the Holy Spirit. If you check the life of Jesus, it was a life of perpetual submission to the Holy Ghost. The cross will sentence you to a life of perpetual submission to the Holy Ghost. Perpetual. A Christian who is not submitted to the Holy Ghost will never walk in the experience of the provisions of the cross. Because the demands of the cross is what makes the provisions of the cross available. So you know you are righteous but you are still sin. The problem may not be your revelation. The problem may be in the area of submission. You know you have the power of God but there is crisis in your family. You cannot release the power. The problem is not in your revelation. The problem is in your submission. Submission is no longer a doctrine. It's now a life. They taught you the doctrine and brought the revelation. Now to walk in the experience of life must conform.
Paul said something. He said, I beseech you, brethren, that you present your bodies, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And he said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That doctrine, that teaching, the revelation brings renewal of the mind. But submission to the Holy Ghost presents the body. And he said something. He said, then you will be able to articulate. Then you will be able to prove what is the will of God. So there is one thing to know, but there is another thing to prove. Prove means manifest. So the only time you can manifest the dimensions that the cross provides you is when you present yourself in perpetual submission to the Holy Ghost. That's when most of us, our Christianity ends. In the church, we are leaders. Everybody knows us. But in the dark, we are different people. But the Holy Ghost is with you even in the dark. And the Holy Ghost will keep speaking, keep talking, because His goal is to bring you into all reality. All reality includes your health, includes your prosperity, includes your success in life. It's the Holy Ghost that brings you into all reality. But to what degree are you submitted? Many believers are not submitted to the Holy Ghost. So they are quoting the Bible, and the more they quote, the more they are frustrated. The lady stands up and he says, All things are working for me. And then she wakes up the last time she celebrated her birthday, she was 29. Her heart begins to beat. She's talking, but there's fear. And she doesn't know the play. The play is in her, her inability to submit to the Holy Spirit. And then she wakes up, she's 33. That time her faith is now overrun. So she begins to look for help. What kept her at that point to the level where her faith is subdued? She refused to yield to the demands of the Holy Ghost. The demands of the Holy Ghost are the key to spiritual experience. But many never submit to them. That's why it looks as if Christianity is a lie. But nothing is as true as Christianity. But the reality of Christianity is that it is born in the spirit. Sometimes the Holy Ghost leads you to a man and quickens the hunger. And then you receive the hunger for prayer. And then the first two days you begin to pray every night. And then somebody comes up with a seasonal movie. You would think this is not a sin. Is this thing a sin? This is not a sin. And then the Holy Ghost says, Don't watch. Don't. Don't. And then you watch part one. While you are watching, you are sensing that the Holy Ghost on your inside is grieved. But you act as if nothing is happening. You become callous towards the Holy Spirit. And then in the night, you come religiously and kneel down and say, Lord, have your way in my life. Are you not a clown? The Lord wants to have his way. You refuse him. But you come back in the night and say, Lord, it is so most of us are lucky that carnal men don't hear God. Because if we hear God, we would have heard a lot of things. For your safety, that's why you don't hear God. The same God that came telling you in the morning what to do to enter into experience. You refuse to do it. And then at night you kneel down and you begin to tell God how he should do this, how he should do that. But that's what he's trying to lead you into that you reject it. And then you come to have your way. Even the angels that walk with you, they will look at you and they will marvel. What kind of person is this? Is this one the creator? You that disobey the Holy Ghost in the morning, you are acting in the night as if nothing happened it's just like i slapped my brother now and then we quarreled and left and then i came back in the evening and then i'm acting as if nothing happened are you a human being your angels will marvel so when you start talking then they'll stand like this some of them will be surprised for two weeks submission to the holy spirit is what brings you into the experience of the provisions of the cross. Many are not submitted. That's why you're quoting the Bible will not bring power. Because it's an economy that works when your mind and your spirit, your body is yielded to the Holy Spirit. God doesn't have a strange way of getting a man to work with him. It's the same way demons use. That's why demons create appetite to facilitate your cooperation with them. The Holy Ghost brings you revelation. So that if you know, then you will walk with Him. He says, How be it when the Spirit of truth is come, He will guide you into all reality. What reality are you walking in? It's a revelation of your level of submission. Don't you see the way the Habalists behave? You think the Habalists doesn't like bed and the city? 
Why does he collect money? But for him to relate with the spirit and to keep hearing the voice of that spirit, he needs to shut away from distraction. That's why most of them live in the forest. It's not written anywhere that Havali should live in the forest. But at this point, they have submitted to a level where what that spirit taught them to do is the definition of their life. So they can abandon the, the, the duplex. They can abandon the cars and go to stay in that forest. Where all they do is to interact with that spirit. I will give you a formula. If you shut down Facebook, WhatsApp, and a lot of friends for 21 days, most of you, your eyes will open in the spirit. So you will know that your eyes were not shut. It was distraction that sealed your lenses. Anybody you see doing exploit for God is just a manifestation of his degree of submission. Exploits are products of submission. And the Holy Ghost will demand it rigidly from your life. Demons don't care how much doctrine you understand. Demons become afraid the day you begin to obey God. The day you choose to obey God. Go home now and say, I will not go on Facebook for three days. You'll be shocked. As you wake up, it will be as if they are plunging you with dagger. The devils begin to think, tell you how many lies you have now. Because they know that obedience for a Christian is a dangerous arsenal against darkness. Hey. Hey. Oh. We don't even have time again. And I had five things I wanted to show you. Uh -huh. What's your level of submission? The degree to which God can commit authority to you is the nature of your life you have given to Him. If your life is not on the altar, forget about exploits in the kingdom. Go and look at the life of the elders, the patriarchs. They lived as if God was everything life was all about. Some of us today, our priority is our hair. Some of us is our dress. In this semester, we already have several hairstyles for two, two weeks each. And then we don't mad mind sleeping with strange men to carry those hairstyles. Those hairstyles have become our cause. Some of us is phones. Phones. I know some people who were born because of Blackberry Boat 5. But today, if they dash you Blackberry Boat 5, will you use it? It's a revelation of the vanity of life. The things you sacrifice your life for three years ago, you don't even remember them. Some ladies, the reason they were disverging is because they wanted to buy a particular phone. So they went with the man. Ask them, what is the phone brand now? They don't remember. But that's why they lost their virginity. It's the strategy of the demonic to make you irrelevant in life forever. Because if you don't pay attention to the demands of the cross in time, in eternity there will be no reward for you. Flesh will take you away from God, but obedience will bring you into the experience of God. Can you bow your heads, let's pray. We don't have time. One of the bodies we have in this conference is the body of time. We will pray in tongues for 10 minutes. And what we want to achieve is a trigger for the zeal of the Lord. So that every area we struggle with obedience. Every area where the Holy Ghost. Some of us for the past three months, the Holy Ghost have been troubling us on one thing. One. They are not two. They are not three. One. But we have not been able to obey. It's a sign of how far we are from God. We can be in church every morning. We can be the choir mistress. We can even be the fellowship president. But we are far. We are far. Because the sign of intimacy is a revelation that only submission can display. Stop praying. You can stop. It's time for apostolic activation. There are 12 of you that the hand of God is about to rest on to activate the apostolic power and office. Holy Spirit, 
from the left to the right from the front to the back of this building I release fire I don't want it emotional it's an activation of eternal ordination there are 12 of you here that are apostles the Lord has appeared to some of you I come tonight as a witness and in the name of Jesus I command that apostolic fountain begin to rush open 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 we are the apostles we are the apostles touch them Holy Spirit touch them touch them So some of you think it's just about preaching you can be an apostle in the governmental front you can be an apostle in the educational world and I see over seven female apostles over seven over seven over seven and as I speak now I stir the waters I stir the waters I stir the waters come alive in the spirit don't be distracted is the hour of visitation don't be distracted hey. don't bring them, bring them forward if your quorum is complete I stop apostles, apostles that we set the foundation of this temple that we set the foundation of this campus that we challenge the powers Listen, listen, listen. There are three of you. Listen. I need you to hear because the energy is communicated by vibration. There are three of you that are workers of miracles. In the past three months, you've been having angelic visitation. Some of you have seen light, some of you have had sensations, some of you have heard footsteps. It's a, it's a calling, it's an ordination, and I come tonight as a witness of Zion. I stretch my hand in your direction. I say, let the powers begin to touch you. The powers, the powers, the powers. Take in the name of Jesus. Take in the name of Jesus. Take in the name of Jesus. Yeah. 
Jesus. Walk out of the Commission many of you. There are three of you that the Lord told you. As you go for your NYC, He said He will use you to start a prayer network. You don't know how to go about it, but there's a wisdom that makes for the move of the Spirit. There's a wisdom. I've seen people that the Lord is dropping a work in their hand. Where are you? Run out quickly. Run out. Let me place the seal of commissioning on your life. When you were there, when you were there, lift your hands up, lift your hands up. When you were there, you were there. I'm seeing a young man that light, light appears to you, light. You see visible light. Where is this person? Come. Light, light, visible light appears. Appears to you. Come this way. Visible light appears to you. Lift your hands. Let me begin with you. Barakapas kapash. Zedededesh kaparadash. Radatiyatatash. I activate it. The apostolic office over your life. I activate you. Talk. 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 Marapanga Padadash. Celebrando Sorotes. Those of you here, stretch your hands towards me. Stretch your hands.
Some meetings are like that. Just lift your hands toward heaven. There is somebody here. Listen. There is somebody here that is a rocket revivalist. But they mistake your courage for arrogance. I want to release a fire. And that will be done for tonight. If they give me time tomorrow, I'll have time to minister in the spirit. Father! 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 Who is that one with the revivalist comment? Who is that one? With the revivalist fire. I stretch my hands in that direction. I release the flow. I release the flow. <laughs> Thank you, precious Holy Spirit, Father, the family that we have to congregate under the standings of your reality. Precious Father, we ask that this morning that you open our eyes to understand the things that are freely given to us. And we ask, O oh God, that you give us the capacity to walk in the reality of that which is known. Take all the glory, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to Jesus. You may be seated. God bless you. This morning again, it's my honor and privilege to be here to share the word of the Lord with you. I want to especially appreciate my dad in the house, God's servant. Pastor Sunday Obaka and his beautiful wife. <laughs> Who also happens to be my mama. <laughs> Glory to God. You know, when you are a young preacher, you enjoy a lot of blessings. And one of those blessings is the blessing of spiritual covering. When you have men that have gone ahead, men that have paid the price men that are able to boast different dimensions of God, providing you blessing and covering. And this morning, I'm grateful to God to have such personalities in our dear Father the house. I also want to appreciate all the elders in the house this morning. Our professor who happens to be the chairman of council. Thank you so much, sir. And everybody here, all the pastors, thank you for being the covering that our generation desperately needs. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I will be sharing the word of the Lord with us briefly this morning. And I will take time to pray for a while. See what the Lord will be doing. Pastor said something, he said, we are comforted in the Lord. And that's so encouraging. For someone who just walked in to a situation like this on the ground, it's so difficult you know, to give expression to the Holy Spirit on your inside. And this morning we trust that the Lord will be helping us in Jesus' name. Thank you, everyone that is here, those who came in because of the program. Thank you for coming. God bless you. I said yesterday that this is a very rich ground, very rich spiritual ground. Most of the revelations that have changed the body of Christ in our time and have given accurate perspective to what the Lord is doing and has given us wisdom, counsel and instruction on how to handle the things of the Spirit and to move in the Spirit, they came from this platform. Aside the fact that Dan is doing a great work here, this is the ground of Koinonia. Where the legendary 
Apostle. Apostle Joshua Selman, ministers of the rest of the world. Such a great blessing to be standing on this podium. Uh, I stand here this morning greatly humbled, with great respect for his service to the body of Christ. You know, I was saying yesterday that I was hoping sincerely, given that Koinonia was Friday and I came in on Saturday, I said maybe I will step on some of the places where he stepped. <laughs> so that by standing here myself, will receive invitations from the servant of God. It's such a humbling experience. And we trust that this morning, again, the Lord will be giving us insight that will be particular to what He wants to do in our lives as it will give us relevance in what He is doing corporately in this dispensation. It's one thing to be very knowledgeable about the things of God, to be so vast about the things of God and to have readily with you the knowledge of what the Lord is doing in the generation. But there is an unfortunate possibility that can be dealt with such a one to know everything about what God is doing, but not to be a partaker of it. Because it's not enough to know. It only becomes enough when you have the spiritual discipline to be subjected to the demands of what God is doing. Then you can be a partaker. You can know, and the more you know, the more you become proud and calm. But a man who sustains the disposition of yieldedness to the Holy Spirit in obedience to respond to the demands of the move of God in the generation is a man that will be part of the heritage of what God is doing. Paul came to the church of Corinth. These guys have mastered the ways of the Spirit so much that they display different gifts of the Spirit. They understood the teachings of Paul, they understood the teachings of Apollos. So Paul became a ground of revelation. But when Paul came to diagnose the texture of the church in Corinth, Paul discovered they were kind of they were babies. So spiritual knowledge, dexterity, in spiritual intelligence and oratorial capacity does not directly translate to depth and stature in the spirit. So most times you come to a place where there is so much revelation and you think you will find the best quality of Christians. But you'll be amazed that that is where you find the most shadow people and then you find the most proud people who are not partakers of what God does. So it behoves every one of us to become very humble, especially where we are, when we are in a place where God is doing what He's doing. For those of us who are of the remnant family, we interact with Apostle Arume every day, sometimes on a very informal note. And then if you are not careful, because you know Him on an informal note, you become separated from what God is doing. People who hear about Him from afar, they enter into encounters and spiritual experiences that most of the people who are on ground never have the experience of. Some become so used to these messages that they score it. But there are few others who just heard one of his messages and their lives are transformed. Even the extensive prayer exercise that we do every day in Revenant to some people becomes a religious routine. So they know that we pray every Monday to Wednesday for three hours and then we run each every Friday and then sometimes once in a month we run prayer stretch for 10 hours. So these things become religious routines. Meanwhile, somebody else hears a stay in a Christian land and a prayer movement begins. And that person in three months experiences a transformation that the one who is on ground for three years does not have. Because we become used to what God is doing. We know how the services run, we know what the Holy Ghost will do, and we know the Lamb of God. And that is why I told us yesterday that in order to maximize what God is doing, we need to go back to the message of the cross. 
And the Holy Spirit helped us yesterday to see that the message of the cross was the bedrock of apostolic doctrine. And I showed us from scriptures how the major emphasis of Paul's teaching was built from the cross. He said that Jews sought signs and wonders. The Greek sought wisdom. He said, but we preach Christ and him crucified. And Paul said, for the strength of that message, our faith will not be built on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. He told the church in Galatians, in Galatia, that his doctrine was such that he was able to beat Jesus Christ on the cross for them. So when you heard Paul, it was as if you were there when Jesus was crucified. And the reason for which you went to the cross became bare to you. You would understand it and you would commit your life to it. And I said there were two dimensions to the cross. The provisions of the cross and the demands of the cross. It would be impossible to experience the provisions of the cross unless you have subscribed sufficiently to the demands of the cross. It is a cardinal emphasis of apostolic teaching. So Paul narrated everything that Jesus did and the potentials of everything that Jesus did in the Gospel of Romans. And from Romans chapter 1 to chapter 8, Paul revealed what Jesus did for the whole world. In order to bring the world into the full heritage of everything God has provided. And in Romans chapter 9 to Romans chapter 11, he referred particularly to the Jews. Showing them every potential possibility they have in God on account of the finished works of Jesus. But when he went to chapter 12, he said, Therefore, dearly beloved. Therefore means what I want to share with you from now on depends on what I have shared before now. He said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Do not conform to this world, but be a transformed by the renewal of your mind. So Paul said, separation from the world and committal of life to God is what becomes the basis of demonstrating what God has given to us. Because in chapter in verse 3 of that scripture, he said, then you will be able to show. The word show is not the same as you know. It's possible to study. He said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13 to 18, he said, until I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. He said, do not undermine the gifts that have been given to you by the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. So it is possible to know by reading. He says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a watchman that need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. So you can read and study and have an accurate understanding of specific emphasis in the kingdom. But that you know does not mean you have the ability to demonstrate. Because when it comes to demonstrating spiritual realities, there is an urgent need for fraternity with the spirit that hosts that reality. Because it is the working of that spirit in your life that translates to demonstration. So the word know is the word I do become aware. He said, whoever is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. All things are passed away. He said, behold. That means become aware that all things have become new. The word is I do but through study, through revelation, through exhortation and doctrine, you can become aware. But it doesn't mean you have the ability to demonstrate. Paul said the only time the ability to demonstrate is given to a man is when that man comes to fraternity by paying the sacrifice of alignment. So he said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. He said, then you will be able to show the word show is the word dokimasu. It means having the ability to demonstrate what you have. So on the strength of the cross, everything God has for humankind is already deposited in our spirit. But the frustration of humanity is the inability to demonstrate what we carry in our spirit. So a man knows he is the righteousness of God, but he can't understand why he is a slave of masturbation. 
He knows it's a righteousness of God. He can't understand why he's a slave of immorality. He knows it's the righteousness of God, but it is controlled and powered by secret things. He can even come to a church where through commitment and zeal for the Lord, he is made a leader in the church, but in his heart, he knows he's a slave. Every time he watches, people shout, jump, and cry. When he goes home, he loses his teeth, he's crying. Because he knows what he's saying, he doesn't have the ability to demonstrate it. And I told us that spirits are not interested in what we know. Spirits are interested in the economy of life that is at work on our inside. Because the life at work in our inside is manifested as spiritual energy. That energy is what changes our world. So Jesus says to be witnesses. He didn't say to be teachers. He didn't say to be preachers. He said to be witnesses. So you have to first of all become a proof of a reality before you can teach it. So we are witnesses before we are preachers, before we are teachers, before we are apostles, before we are prophets. The day we lose the ability to be witnesses, our preaching is vain, no matter how intelligent it sounds, because it will have no power to challenge the powers that be. So principalities come to contend with the quality of life you have, not the doctrine you preach. Jesus said that prince of this world come to me and find it nothing. He had not started preaching. The man knew that this is a witness. Because every time a witness speaks, the spirit of the utterance is communicated. So beyond teaching and education, he is communicating spirit. So Jesus said, the words that I preach, he said, they are spirit, they are life. You may be educated listening to me, but beyond education, I am communicating a spirit to you because I am a witness. And in order to be able to demonstrate that dimension, Jesus committed his life perpetually to the will of God. So alignment becomes the hallmark of the Christian faith. Young believers will pursue after knowledge, all kinds of wisdom, in order to wow the audience. We are so zealous about showcasing our abilities. But when we grow on this ladder, we understand that obedience is more important. That's why you look at the fathers, they are calm. There was a time when they were zealous like you. But they now understand that it's not in the length of their teaching that men will be transformed. It's the deposit of the spirit. So a man will choose to pray for 10 hours to come and share for 15 minutes. But a younger believer will choose to pray for 30 minutes to come and talk for 3 hours. Because he thinks it's a show. When you understand these things, your life will take new sets of priorities. So we say alignment is more important. Because without alignment, you may know what you have in God, but you will never demonstrate it. That is one of the greatest crises of humankind. We believe that God has not lied. We have faith in God. But we can't explain why our life seems to be beggarly. Our experiences seem to be epileptic. It's not a frustration to hear the scriptures affirm again and again. The worst part is that we come to church and the preacher keeps emphasizing what God has done for us. He will go as far as prophesying it. But every day we go home, we know we are in the middle of frustration. What we turn these situations around is when we make up our mind to come under the government of the Holy Spirit. Because of the dimensions of God that we carry is locked up in that spirit in our inside. And the demonstration of it is called the charisma of the Holy Ghost. What you call the gift of healing is the charisma of the Holy Spirit. What you call word of knowledge is the charisma of the Holy Spirit. The Bible said that gifts of the Spirit was the charisma of the Holy Spirit. So when you become pliable in the hands of God, then your life becomes a portion that the Holy Ghost demonstrates his dimension. So that time you think God is healing somebody. Holy Ghost was actually giving expression to the flavor of healing that it is. So God wants our lives to become platforms upon which He can manifest His dimensions, theaters that reveals His essence. But that will not be possible if we still run by the economy of flesh. So we said the cross is the judgment of God against flesh. 
so that the flesh will die and the glory of God can be revealed. And we said these are not things you do by zeal. Because zeal dies. The only thing that lives through you that is eternal is the spirit that dwells on your inside. So we said there are definite laws in the spirit that brings us to a place where we can allow God to flow through us naturally. So that the supernatural dimension becomes our natural disposition. It's not something we struggle and try to do. It's something we yield and manifest to us. And in order for this thing to become flawless, we said there are laws that we submit ourselves to. And these things flow through us. I was sharing with us yesterday how that it will be such a struggle to be able to lift a, a matter that weighs 80,000 kg. But that is the exact weight of the Boeing aircraft, the Airbus, weighing over 80,000 kg. It's impossible for that matter to float in the wind. So it will be a waste to struggle to carry it. It may fall and kill everybody. You can't even get a crane to lift it to that height. It's impossible. What makes a matter of such mass existing in a frame where law of gravitation is existing to float in the air like paper is a function of laws. It's called the law of aerodynamics. The moment that matter subjects itself to the law of aerodynamics, the potential of flight becomes natural. And the same way with every one of us, the moment we subscribe to the law of alignment, the flow of the life of God becomes natural. We struggle because we refuse to obey the laws of the spirit realm. And it results in terrible catastrophes because we don't know the powers that cause these things to be. When the law of aerodynamics is distorted, you know that everybody on board, they are already dead. Because you can't manage such a weight unless laws are in place. So we said Romans chapter 8 verse 1 said, There is now therefore no condemnation to them that are Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. But how do you walk after the spirit and not the flesh when you are made of flesh? We said it is the law of life that is Christ Jesus. So it is subjection to law that makes it possible for a man to walk in the spirit. And we call it the law of spiritual life. So we listed those laws yesterday by the help of the Holy Ghost. And for those who are here, you saw that it was not something you do out of zeal or out of, sin or out of fleshly abilities. It was more or less a subjection to the Holy Spirit to flow through your life. This morning I want to show us two things that constitutes the blessings of the cross. I know we've been taught these things again and again and again. But I just want to touch two of them. To bring somebody another level of awareness. You know, you eat the same food every day. If you want to grow, you keep eating it. You can't come to the point where you say, I was eating rice since I was 10 years old. I won't eat rice again. I won't eat it anymore. If you stop eating food, Growth will not just stop you that. So even though we've heard these things again and again and again, we will still hear it again. Hallelujah. You know, this is not chance. So sometimes it's not, we don't get to revival in nature. So that <laughs> people don't keep shouting everywhere, but they don't have principles to be bad. You know, in the church setting, we are taught principles and laws. When we go for the rabbi meetings, we set people on fire. But you don't live by the fire you catch. How many of you want to get married and then you remember when you were slain under the anointing? And then on the strength of the slain anointing, you now say, This is my husband. <laughs> when you want to get married, you will sit down and begin to remember everything you were told. That's when you remember that the man must be spiritual. You remember that the man must have the fear of God. Remember that the man must be submitted to spiritual authority. Most times you didn't hear those things from the revival camp meetings. You heard them from the church. When the pastor was talking, I looked as if it's not important. 
But when you want to make any decision in your life, those things that look not important, those are the things that will confine your decision making process. <laughs> so the fire keeps us burning. But the wisdom capsules are the things that determine the direction that we will go. And the value of our life is a function of the quality of decisions that we make. So this morning I want to show us two provisions that will bring us another heightened level of awareness on what Jesus has paid for and how to maximize it. And then we will pray applying it this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You see, we've been taught basically the four major provisions that we receive on account of the cross. One of it is healing, one of it is salvation. Salvation generally includes it, it's awful. Salvation of the spirit is deliverance from the messianic judgment. Salvation of the soul is deliverance from demonic powers. Salvation of the body is what you call healing, and salvation of your circumstances is what you call prosperity. Are we together? So these are four major food salvation that we've been taught over the years. Deliverance from messianic judgment, which brings us justification in the spirit. Deliverance from demonic powers will bring salvation to the soul and salvation from sin as transformation. And then deliverance from the body, which is healing. And then deliverance from circumstances, which is prosperity. Hallelujah. But I want to give us something more elaborate that will inform our operation with more confidence and audacity. Because if you are just taught salvation from the body as healing, every time you want to approach it, you are going to be looking for the principles that work. And your lack of full understanding of those principles and how it works may constitute a deflection of the energy of your faith. And then it will become a matter of struggle. So I want to give us two broad umbrellas of what God has done that will encompass all of these four dimensions. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You see, one of the greatest crises of humankind from the beginning of creation was the inability to know who God was. A spirit being created the world out of nothing. And then he created the man and threw the man into the world. And he just began to relate to the man. The Bible said every morning in the cool of the day, the voice of the Lord came walking with that. So the man didn't understand what kind of species is this thing. He didn't even as much as call it a name because he didn't know what this being was. So he only lived to follow the instructions of this being. So much so that a point came where the being gave him laws that indicted his existence. He said, The day you eat of this fruit, of this tree, he said, You will die, die. And the man didn't understand the implication of that contract because he didn't know the being that was talking to him. What do you mean, die? Why are you? You just want to give instructions. You just want to tell me what to do. And then obviously you are the one who created all this thing. But who are you? So he followed this being like that until he failed. And through to the words of this being, he died. And he died. And then the human race continued like that. So a point came where the fathers discovered that of the truth, this being was suffering. And his words regulated and controlled the possibilities in the realm where they dwelt. So all they did was they would look at the being when it does something that is beyond their level, that is outside of the possibilities that they are used to. They now use a name to tie to that manifestation. So this being comes and somebody is sick and the being heals the person. They know that healing is not something that humankind has the capacity to fulfill. But because this being had the ability to orchestrate the process of healing in the life of a human being, they now say, this being is called healer. This being is called what? Healer. Now, on the strength of that name that they tie to that being, every time they sought healing, they will invoke that name. So those names became principles in which the presence of God were locked. And they carried it on their shoulders and handed it over from one generation to another. So, the names in which they blocked the dimensions of this being became the greatest heritage that they left for their children. So, Abraham, for example, walked in lack and scarcity for a long time until he contacted this being. And this being told him, just believe in me and I will give you an heir. 
and it took Abraham 25 years to understand that this view will sustain the power to make fertile that which was dead. And the day he believed it, and this thing produced that dimension, he now said, This being is called El Shaddai. The meaning is that from the womb of this being, humankind have the liberty of being sustained of every form of infirmity that they have. So he handed over the name El Shaddai to his son Isaac as an eternal heritage. So when God came to speak to Moses, he said, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew me as El Shaddai. So the greatest heritage that Abraham handed over to his children was not the cattle that he had. It was what he caught in the spirit realm, locked in the name that he gave to his son. So every time his son walked with that name, even though the cattle were finished, even though the waters were dried up, so long as the son had that heritage called El Shaddai, he could dig wells in the dry land and water would come out. Because the El Shaddai meant having the ability to cause creation to produce. So when Abraham blessed his son, he didn't bless him with wine and corn, he blessed him with the name. This is the name by which I found this unseen reality, this being that is locked outside the borders of humankind. He has the ability to cause evil death to come back to life. Hope you remember when Abraham wrote his PhD thesis. God tried him to, be, to know whether he understood the meaning of El Shaddai. And God came to him. After he waited for 25 years to receive Isaac, God now told him to go and kill Isaac. And he said, to kill your only child. Just in case you think you have others, I'm reminding you that this is the only one you have. And then he added another thing that he recap pain in the heart of Abraham. He said, the one that you love. That was the greatest exam that humankind had to write in the days of Abraham because the posterity, the posterity of humankind rested on the seed of Abraham. So God wanted to know whether the confidence of Abraham was in this dimension of God that he has found or it was based on the things that he had at hand. If Abraham will understand the true scope and import of El Shaddai, then the powers of the El Shaddai will be really invested in that name. So he said to him, go and kill Isaac. And Abraham was wise enough not to tell Sarah because if he had told Sarah, Sarah would have migrated to Isaac. <laughs> so he carried the boy early in the morning and vanished. He said, We are going to worship God. What is worship? You want to go and kill your only child? <laughs> so we are going to worship. We are going to worship. That was the hardest example. You know, that's not kindergarten. You know, kindergarten faith is when you come and say, Lord, give me bread, and then bread shows up, you see a boy, and they grow. Lord, give me car, and then somebody comes after three days, they say, I was led to give you this car. Say, wow, oh boy, we get power, we get power. <laughs> Jesus said, this commandment have I received of the Father, that I have the power to lay down my life and to take it up again. True power is when a man comes to a point where everything he has is willing to give it away because there is a confidence working on his inside that the God he knows is the one that suffices him of all things. That's a man who can walk into a desert and make it a forest. He doesn't cleave to the things that he has. He has a God that wherever he walks into, everything that was lacked will become a possibility because he carries something that is invisible on his inside. That man can give everything he has and go to a strange nation. He may go to heaven without money in his pocket. I heard stories of men like John Chilik. He was coming to Africa with his family and he had nothing. Even the money to pay for his ship fare, he had no dime. And then when he came, they killed him. And people were paying, receiving their receipts. And then he was going. The line, it was 10 persons were left. And the guy was still going, Oh, God, you mad? People come there to present their ticket you don't have. And you are carrying a family of seven. Where are you walking to? It's a man that knows the El Shaddai. <laughs> when he walked, three persons to where they were collecting the ticket, somebody came and said he wasn't there to give this group. He doesn't know the man from anywhere. Because a man who has El Shaddai, even creation is sentenced to a law of supply for that man. The air that you breathe will become a sustenance. The waters will support you. Even the land will respond. That's why God said to make Isaac stay put in Gela. Everybody was migrating to Egypt, but Isaac won, he stayed in Gela. There was no hope, but he knew the El Shaddai. So the name of God is the greatest inheritance of the nation. And Abraham caught that name and he gave it to his son as an inheritance. Why do you think Isaac will sit down and tell Jacob, I bless you with corn and wine? 
They don't have the gap to the loss of inflation anymore. You can live here and go to Mozambique. It's a man that comes the answer that say, I bless you with corner wine. Even the land of Mozambique, they respond to you. This man knew the powers that shoot the foundations of the world. But he had to go through the test of alignment to enter into that scope and power of knowledge. And he sacrificed Isaac. I was trying to read the Bible to find out how Abraham answered this question. Because this question was the question that the immortal one himself gave to mankind. You know, when God wants to promote a man, he makes him an examination. The exam we write is not a revelation of human intelligence. Humankind studied the spirit realm and they fabricated everything we do from the realm of the spirit. The Bible said to Moses, he said, teach them laws, teach them ordinances, and teach them statutes. That is the foundation of human intelligence. Moses made available spiritual possibilities to the natural. So everything we do today as a lifestyle is a revelation of the things that Moses downloaded. That's why the laws of all the nations of the world were built on the laws of Moses. There's no promotion without an examination. And the kind of answer you write is what determines who you become. When I checked the script of Abraham, we discovered that Abraham wrote. He said he believed that God, who gave him this child, was able to raise him back to life in the sequel. So Abraham knew that the name El Shaddai means having the ability to cause life to come out of death. And when he wrote that question, he scored and made. <laughs> because Jesus wrote and he said, he said, men will come from the east, the west, the north, and the south to salute Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. These men, because of the way they passed their exams with God, even when they were on earth, they knew that they had a throne in heaven. How can Paul be walking on earth and say, I have run my race, I have finished my course. What is left for me now is the crown. What do you mean? When you are saying, am I saved? Am I not saved? People are back are debating whether salvation is eternal or not. Somebody has left the realm of salvation. He doesn't just know he will be rewarded. He will be telling you the quality of his reward. You know the people that wear crowns in heaven. I don't think you have an idea. <laughs> in the whole scripture, not even the seraphims of glory wear crowns. Not even the cherubims wear crowns. The only beings that we are crowned in heaven are the 20 and 4 elders that sit on 20 and 4 thrones. So Paul is telling you that in heaven I have a throne. <laughs> it's a knowledge that you enter when you pay prices. Because you will come to a point where God will tell you that because you have rejected the world, I have become your shield and your experience the world. I am your reward. These were men that journeyed into parts that very few dared to wonder. He said, Paul and Barnabas. He said, these be the men that turned their walls upside down. The Bible says, the 12 disciples of Jesus, they said they turned the foundations of the nation upside down. You have not come to a point to make a sacrifice where you can move the hand of the heavens. Then you don't know the God that you talk about. You reign.
Although you have names, but in the realm of the spirit, there's no authority on your name. So we understood another dimension of name that names are not actually meant to give you identity. Names are actually signatures of authority in the realm of the spirit. So when they saw the healer, they said, He is El Shaddai. When we saw, when they saw the refuge, they said, He is Jehovah Nisi. So every time you come under Jehovah Nisi, you don't need to pray, you are covered. The moment you understand the meaning of this, you are covered. And that was why, in the life of Jesus, you know he was Jehovah Adonai, he was Jehovah El Shaddai. All the names that God had was invested in one personality called Jesus. The Bible said in Colossians 2 9 that he pleased the Father, that the fullness of the Godhead should dwell in him body. But God wanted to promote mankind. To a place where we do not only need to go and find the meaning of El Shaddai and then we will be provided. Then when we need to win the war, we go and look for the meaning of Jehovah Ra. When we need children, we go, no, no, no. God wanted to give us a promotion so that through one name, every one of us, if we call it every other thing, we will respond. So the strategy of the cross was to give you a name that is both El Shaddai, both Jehovah Nisi, both Jehovah Ra, both Jehovah Elohim, both Jehovah Tikkunu. The name of Jesus became an envelope that carried the fullness of the possibility of God. So the greatest gift that the cross made available to you is a name. My friend Victor, uh, three days ago, somebody hacked into his Facebook. And when the person hacked into his Facebook, he changed his password. And the moment the person changed his password, he began to send messages to people. And there's this business, if you do this business, you will gain 50,000 in 45 minutes. So when he sent it, everybody thought it was victory. Before we knew what was happening, somebody had sent 50,000 already. If that's the power of a name, the moment they saw that message, the integrity of Victor all his life was invoked. So that message did not only carry the meaning that was written, that message carried the DNA and the signature of Victor. So the people that read that text, they were not trying to see whether this thing is logical. When they were reading that text, they were seeing the integrity of it. So even though he said, throw this money away, you will see it after many days. They were not hearing the, the reasonability of the language. It was the integrity of who spoke that they were seeing. So in less than 30 minutes, people began to give money. The man had to run on Facebook and write a lot of disclaimers and say, this is not me. This is not me. Please, God. <laughs> it's the power of me. That's why we can throw our bread on water. Because when we hear, it is the answer time that we are seeing. It's not how logical it is. He said, give your all and after many days you will find it. You, are, you will not be wanting, but what means will I find it? How is it possible? He said, call my name and every knee shall bow. You are not wondering, is it demons, is it principality? He said, call my name. So the moment you hear it, you know that that name can the investment of the totality of the Godhead. But before Jesus came to the point where he gave that name to humankind, there was a price he needed to pay as a man. So the name Lord was not given to Jesus the Christ, it was given to Jesus the man. Because Jesus the Christ, the fullness of the Godhead was already in him. Jesus didn't need promotion, he's God. But he had to wear the garment of man. The Bible said he stripped himself. Philippians 2 verse 5 to 9 of the garment of divinity and he took the form of man so he paid the sacrifice in the form of man so the name that he has as the son of god that name he can now share with mankind so the greatest blessing of the cross is that you become the recipient of the name of jesus every time you invoke it every time you show up in the name of jesus even the whole elements of the spirit realm will see jesus not you is the gift of the cross. That's why when we confront challenges, we come. All you need to do is to say, I come in the name of the Lord. Because the price was paid for you to become the recipient of that name. It's one of the greatest gifts that human can have. The authority you have in the spirit realm is beyond your sacrifice. It is just based on the sacrifice of Jesus. But you need to be aware that you are now a bearer of the authority that is in that name. This is where you receive the gift that is beyond healing. If all you know about the cross is that you have healing, because it was by his stripes you were healed, you 
will still be limited. But if you know that in the name of Jesus, everything about the cross was part of it. Everything about God was part of it. When you carry that name, it is a cure to all of human affliction. I was praying for my sisters. One of them 32. One of them 34, two 32, not married. And these were beauty queens. You know, when they were 24, 25, 26, those days was when Brazilian weed was ready. So they would buy weed, 45,000. They are shoes there, my sister used to call it choker. The shoe had long heels. So when they wear it, they stand like this. And then they are walking with audacity. When you want to talk to them, if you don't, if you are a young man and you don't know who you are, you won't approach them. You will be afraid of embarrassment. <laughs> because of elegance. Elegance. When they became 34 and 35, then they now discover that man is not a function of beauty, it's a function of favor. <laughs> <laughs> because all their friends who were ugly, who had no class, when they meet now, they are talking about husband and children. Ah, I need to go and feed my child. So when they come back from just with their friends, they come back crying. But those days, when they come back, they are the star. All their friends talk about them. They hail them, they hail them, then they dash them on. Now those friends that look as if they were disadvantaged in life, through favor, they have a home. And now they discover that their place was not in their father's house. They needed help. That was when they now invoke their brother. The boy that was going to church, and they say, focus on your studies, so. <laughs> They didn't know that I was paying the price to become the custodian of the name. I knew that by the cross, there was a name that gave me authority, not just in this world, but in the world to come. It's that power that governed the age to come. I was pursuing after that name because I knew that one day all of them will depend on me, including my father. <laughs> because I am the hope of my father. So I knew if I failed, I have failed the generation. So when I was laboring in prayers and fasting, sometimes those days I fasted until if you see me, it's only my head. My neck was so long I was like this. They didn't know that I was fighting to enter into a spiritual economy. And when I apprehended the name, that time they were 34 and 32. So they came to me. They said they needed help. And the moment they recognized the grace, I said, I send you forth. <laughs> At this time, I have known that I am the priest over the family. It is the things I allow that can happen. But I was not told as a story. Sometimes in the place of prayer, the wall of my house will vanish. And then I will see myself standing in my father's compound. And God will show me the principality that and then he will tell me the power of this one is right the power of this one is immorality the power of this one is darkness we never do these things so i was learning from a syllabus that is superior to everything i studied in school meanwhile i'm not encouraging anybody to leave his education because currently i'm doing my phd <laughs> i'm not talking down on education but I'm telling you that in order to be relevant, you need to study from all the realms of God. There are three realms in this world. The supernatural realm, where the power and the government of God dwells. The preternatural realm, which is your foolish realm, where the angelic and the demonic operate. And then the natural realm, where your body and your five senses dwell. You need to learn from the three realms. If you only study from the foolish realm, you'll be limited. Because a professor in the foolish realm will be a, 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 a kidakati in the face of a 10 year old who works in the witchcraft of the reason is not because they hear in the witchcraft who will know so much. The realm where she is coming from is superior to the natural realm. So as a professor, you may have hit the zenith in the soulish realm. But the girl that joined witchcraft for one week, she is coming from the higher realm. So that girl can touch the prof like this. And the prof will become paralyzed. Because what she has is a knowledge in the higher realm. So if you want to be recognized, you need to study from the three realms of God. I was studying from the realm of the spirit because I knew that one of the greatest benefits of redemption was the name of Jesus. And that name does not work when it's pronounced alone. It works as a government. I needed to know the things to do, the appetites to kill, the burdens to bear in order for that name to answer through my voice. And 
when I gained some level of mastery, I began to control the possibilities of my family. One day, my dad woke up, and then the left part of his body was no longer working. And then they said, it's partial paralysis. I thought he was straight into my body. When they came to my body, they sat down. And then I walked around. I was speaking in tongues. They don't know the meaning of tongues. <laughs> they think it's a language, but I know it's a mystery. I didn't know. God did not open my eyes to see what was the cause. And I knew it would be a waste of time to begin to research into the spirit to find out who shot this arrow, who shot this arrow. I knew what was happening around me was a mystery. So me too, I began to play on the economy of mysteries. So I spoke in tongues, I spoke in tongues, I spoke in tongues, I spoke in tongues, I spoke in tongues. After three days, I said, I said they should take it back. When they took it back, it became strong. <laughs> we study in the realm where it matters the most. But there are many people who don't know the importance and the significance of a life. So they quote the things that Jesus has done. That's why you don't have experience. No man is special. Everybody is manifesting to the degree to which he submits to the law that makes things happen. You are mighty, you are your You reign, you ancient are your The first time you enter, you'll be a slave. Because there are six levels of relationship with God. You'll be a slave knowing nothing. So a demon can come and knock you like this. So you fall, you have fear. After three days, you wake up again. You begin to fast again. A demon beat your stomach, you want to vomit. After three days, you wake, take drugs and recover. Then you continue again. Then after some time, God will not make you a disciple. Then the next time, the Holy Ghost will come and say, Don't fast six to six again. Fast six to three. So the Holy Ghost is teaching you how to resist that law of the demon. You don't have authority yet. So he's teaching you laws. So, so long as you follow it, or he will come and say, pray in the night from 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. So if you are praying in the night from 1 a.m. to 2 a.m., that demon will have no power over you. You are a disciple. So your security and the possibilities of God that you experience is subject to the degree of your obedience to those laws. Then you grow, you become a friend. Then after the Holy Ghost begin to teach you secrets. You know the names are covered by secrets. You are turning from a slave to a disciple, you are turning from a disciple to a friend. Jesus said you are no longer servants of your friends, therefore I will teach you the secrets of the kingdom. So that time, if you notice, if a demon is coming, you will notice that Christ, something wants to happen. Then you wake up that morning, you don't go out. You pray in tongues the twelve. Then you go. Even when that demon comes, you will move around, move around, there will be no place to touch. You know secrets now. You want to go for interview, then you wake up around my head, you will praise God from one to two. You didn't pray, you are just praising God. When you finish praising God, you will dance and throw one on the floor. As you finish, you now carry your certificate. They say 10,000 people apply, then they will come and pick your own like this. They think it's luck and chance. They didn't know that you were invoking the power secrets. And you are afraid. You want to go for interview, people ask you, they say, it's kept wrong, it's kept wrong. Then the Holy Ghost comes in the morning and asks you three questions. Who was the fifth president of Nigeria? Who was the second governor general of the oil industry? And then those three questions, you say you don't know, you now check on the internet. When you now went for the interview, everybody failed. But when you came, the first person they asked you, they said, who is the second president of Nigeria? And you now see Jesus. They said, who was the second governor general? Oh, you are walking by secret now. That's when men become invisible. Jesus said, as the wind, as the wind blow it. Thou business not from whence it come to where it goes. It says, so are they that are born by the Spirit of God. You woke up that day. You wanted to wear a pink shirt because that's the clothes you collected from the channel. Then the Holy Ghost came and said, wear not your white and black shirt. This is not a doctrine, this is life. Meanwhile, the guy that came from the U.S. that's looking for wife. God has told him that the lady that come around to us with white and black is a wife. You didn't know. <laughs> You didn't know why I pressed the 10,000 for you. You carried the white. You went to the top of the top. It is a good man. I'm there. The white. I'm not dressed. Because that white and black dress that day is not a dress. It's your husband. It's a realm of secret. That's how we rule the world. And then when you graduate from the realm of secret, then God makes you a song. The song is a kingdom. He said, the air. 
we have become joint heirs of Christ because we are children of the kingdom. And that's the second gift of the cross. The second gift of the cross is that you have become a part of the family of God. So God has become your father. God is no longer just your Lord. God is no longer just your disciple. God is no longer just your friend. God is now your father. So he has the responsibility of making things work for you. Hope you know for David to go to war, he needed to consult the Yuri and the Tuni. And the Holy Ghost will tell him that when you see the man trees move, he needs to come ahead. Go, you will conquer. But Abraham did not need to consult the Yuri. He had traveled beyond the grave. Now he's an heir. So he can just say, Go and tell someone, come, let him fight. Fight king and he wins them. Abraham throws a stone like this. He's a son. God is under obligation to provide for him because God is Father. I told us yesterday that the meaning of Father in Hebrew is true. It means the foundation. God becomes the stability of your life. The meaning of Father in the Greek is Father. It means sustainer and nourisher. When God becomes your Father, He is not His responsibility to provide for you. So even the days you make mistakes, God will cover you up. Mercy becomes an economy that works for you. Certain things that were not part of the syllabus of training and the full term of the service. That's why every morning we wake up, the Bible said the message of God and we you every morning. Because you know that sons make you sick. But because they are sons, there is a divine calculation that makes for the advantage, even when they have. It's a privilege that we have because of the cross. And it's on the strength of our sonship that we have authority to make things with you. Because we know we have the backing of Zion. These are provisions that we have. In the cross. That's why when we wake up, we say,
because we are now part of the families of heaven. Our genealogy through the cross travels into the heaven. Our Father, who art in heaven, not who art in Zaria. Even hey, the governor of Zaria, there's Concamina, there's so much you cannot do. But when you pray to heaven, then you mobilize the resources that created the world and gather the foundations of the earth together. It is a mystery that the cross provides us, making us to become part of the family of God. My friend knows I don't pray for anything I need. I'll just wake up in the morning and say, Kai, God said he wants to announce me. Hey, hey, hey. You won't know why it will happen. We we were see, we were very short in Kayana. We will just stay there, we come to lead prayer. But December last year, God said, There's a temptation coming, don't fall. I came and told them, see, see what God is saying. As we were entering into the next week, I said, Baba, God said, This is the year of emergence, the emergence of kings. And then he said, He did the same thing. I said, We now began to call ourselves kings at home. How this thing will happen, we don't know. Remember, we are Shafnika Bearers in what? In Remnant. There are many senior pastors ahead of us on the rank. We were not even ordained at that time. In this year, they put color on my neck. So we were not even ministers. And then a day to my birthday, I said, Oh man, God said He wants to begin to announce me. Hey! How is that going to happen? Rwanda was on your side. What are you calling announcement? The man talks like a god. How will you be here? Your place is to serve so that anything that falls will fall to you. And thank God is a good man. So the things that will fall to you will be enough to sustain your life. But God said, I want to begin to announce you. How will God do this thing? I gave my throne of wealth. The hell Satan wants to announce me. And on my birthday, which is first of March, he said, cut six of your clip and put it on Telegram. It was something. People were troubling him saying, where is this guy's message? When I received the throne announcement, okay, something take. And something released those six clips from Telegram. On the 11th of March, that was 10 days after the kids were released, I received call from 17 nations of the world. <laughs> from Macaulay. How can you be here? On the 14th of March, 13 days after that action, I received four invitations from the United States of America. <laughs> Somebody came. He said, what's the name of your ministry? We want to open a branch. We want to open a head office so that we can have workers working here to coordinate your invitation in the U.S. Do you know how many years it takes to receive invitation outside the borders of your habitation? But the hell is that I came. He said, I will begin to announce it. In Remnant, we have raised the dead. In Remnant, we have seen both men dead. This is not Apostolic testimonies. Those of us who are on ground, we see all kinds of healing, but nobody knew us. But the hell is that I came. He said, I want to begin to announce it. So if I give a charge of five minutes, the angels come and they blow the shofar. <laughs> So people hear, they don't hear my voice, they hear the voice of God. That's why John went into the wilderness until the day of his own God. And when John came out, he didn't know the Bible. All he knew to do was to cry. And when John cried, the Bible said, The whole of Gideon, when it is the blind of an island. You don't know what to carry. Oh, until God speaks, things will change. For the past three months, you can't rest. We have meetings from Tuesday to Sunday. Tuesday to Sunday. Between the last two weeks, you know, we have spoken in five universities with nothing less than 2,500 attendants. People come, they say, we've heard your messages. Oh, thank you for being a blessing to the body of Christ. I say, me? Who taught the body of Christ? Oh, what? what are you talking about? In less than six months, we are in nations. They say they want to bring me to bring you here. How is it happening? Because you have become a part of that family. When alignment quota is complete, then it gives you your inheritance. Wow. And then in the nation, you will be here. You will be in Zaria here. You think it's all about Selman. You don't know what God is doing. These men are called by ordination to be catalyst of revival. The people who will carry the revival, they are not even emerged. Because the revival is a spirit of righteousness and signs and wonders. Some of you that come for Polonia, you are not known. The day of your rising, you will say, you will come and kneel down before someone and say, Thank God, you are the one that made me. Then you say, You will never be aware. You will be shocked that somebody like this who has no name was part of Polonia. You will rise, you will enter the territories, and the dead will rise on their own. And the world will say, A man of wonder has risen because your own quota of alignment have been fulfilled. People who went to the same school with Katukum and they said they didn't remember her. 
because he was so quiet and free. You can't imagine that any sleeper or something can break out of this one. But when the alignment water was completed, he rose up as the brightest revelation of the hidden dimension of God. They were saying by woman, hey, no, hey, women don't have the voice in the north. They are joking. They are joking. They are joking. People talk and consider women now for the United Kingdom. They say, who is this boy? Who is this boy? my son. Alignment. You are a member of the family of God. The first time I heard my message, I said, Kai, I need to go back and work on my intonation because I was talking like an Idoma man. I didn't hear my message. They said my messages are going. I said I will not hear. Because when I heard it, I was so disappointed at the quality of English. How can I be talking like this? I said, no, I want to add some phonetics, some coordination. But every time I tried to compose myself, the life that flowed to the message was choked. So I knew that for me, it was a voice of a man wilderness crying because God came as a father he said this is your inheritance a day will come when some of your hand will not become the hand of God the hand of God so when you come for meeting you can be playing and laughing but when you lift your hand like the scriptures will begin to rise then you will say there is a man that carries the hand of God we do not read about Moses he ran out of Israel he was in the wilderness for 40 years what was he doing attending to sheep but when God visited him the rod that he had all these years that was meant for eating sheep, he didn't know that that was the rod of God. And the point came, that same rod, he will point it to the Red Sea, and the Red Sea will part. That same rod, and army will come to fight Israel, so long as he holds that rod like this, that rod became the banner of God over Israel. What you carry is enough. The problem is that the quota of alignment has not been achieved. When God begins to announce you, you will say, is this in me? You will be shocked because it will be bigger than your imagination. He said, God is able to do exceeding and contact above all you can think or imagine. It's the workings of God. You reign. You reign. You reign. You reign.
most of us are in churches. We cannot as much as come out to carry our responsibilities. When they say there's prayer meeting, the church goes half. If they say there's evangelism, the church goes out. 90% doesn't show up because we don't understand the importance of the things of the kingdom. That's where our true definition lies. Some of the men you go to celebrate, you are greater than them. But you don't know about your ordination. The day of the nation will begin to speak. Hope you know that Paul was in the regions of Galilee and Nazareth. When their Peter were cast, raising cripples by shadows, he said he knew Jesus after the flesh. But he said now he knows him no more. So he saw what they were doing. When Paul's encounter came, he became greater than all the apostles. But will you be willing like Paul to say, Lord, what will you have me do? a chance that that day is yesterday. I want us to pray now. I want us to pray now. We will pray for the next 10 minutes. And then I will pray for some people. And then we will be out of your presence. Who can help us with that chance now? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.